Thank you, Paul. Thank you. Hello. So I'm very excited to be here today to talk about food waste. I know that the topic has come up several times over the last day and a half, and my contribution to this discussion is going to be to take you on a bit of a tour through the past, the present, and what I imagine the future uh, will be related to food waste. So that's where we're going. And uh, I'd like to, to start out, though, by pointing out that this will not be your normal food waste presentation. Every one of these, as I'm sure you know, begins with people saying a third of the food in the world is wasted, and then proceeds to present about 10 minutes of slides and information on the scope of the problem. And I know that this audience does not need that information. From the college and university perspective, this is an issue that's been embraced. From the culinary and chef perspective, this is an issue that uh, we feel deeply. Uh, so I know that this group cares, and so we'll just sort of accept that food waste is a big problem, and it's one that we have to work on in a really intentional way, because we have a really significant negative future in front of us if we don't fix what's going on with our climate, and food waste can be a be a big contributor to that. So where, where are we at this moment? Um, we are in the middle of a full-on fight against food waste. Uh, this is an incredibly dynamic time. We have documentaries. We have the interest of well-known chefs. We have uh, entrepreneurs and capital being attracted to work on this problem. So it's a, it's a good time. There's a lot of energy being directed against it. But I think it's also helpful at a moment like this to look back and say, how did we get to where we are now? And what can we learn about where we're standing today by understanding a little bit about the journey to get here? Um, what's going well today and what isn't? And where might we be heading in the, in the future? So looking backwards. This is something I've never presented before. It happens to be the Articles of Incorporation of a company called LRS Solutions, which was uh, the original name of LeanPath. We were starting up, and we didn't actually know what to call the company, so we just used the initials of the founders. And we filed this with the Oregon Secretary of State in Salem, Oregon, on January 21st of 2004, and started on a journey to work on food waste. And at that time, this was not a popular topic, I can assure you. Uh, and in fact, I remember speaking with my mother, and she didn't understand what, what it was about and why I was doing it. You know, generally, if even your mom isn't excited about something, that's perhaps a reason to think twice about it. But we headed down this journey, and what we knew at that time was that menu prices were growing at a slower compounded annual rate than wholesale food prices, which were rising faster. And what that meant was that margins were being squeezed in the middle of the profit and loss statement. And we believed that that represented pain that people would want to solve. And so we didn't start with a thesis around this, that this was green and sustainable. We began with the idea that people could operate more efficient businesses and more profitable businesses if they went and solved their food waste problems. And so we, we began with that as our, as our premise. The second thing we did was we looked to management science in manufacturing. And we said, aren't kitchens really factories in some way or another? And what might we learn from the manufacturing world, things like Lean and Six Sigma? Could we bring those things into kitchens and begin to do things differently with waste? Because manufacturing had been very successful in reducing waste. And so these were principles, things like data-driven discovery team-based problem solving, root cause analysis. And we said, okay, let's try, to, let's try to do that. And of course, as you all know, kitchens may be factories, but first and foremost, they're creative spaces. And so you might imagine this didn't go exactly as we planned when we headed down this road. But this was the theory. Let's go ahead and create measurement as a mechanism to drive change. So we created this. This was uh, the original Lean Path food waste tracker that we released. I think we put the first one out at the beginning of 2005. It took a little while to develop it. And believe it or not, this was high tech at the time. Uh, it, it's 5.7 inch color touchscreen device, predated all of our smartphones. And we put this into the field and expected that people would be interested. And, Notwithstanding Paul's enthusiasm, generally the press wasn't very interested. And when I went to see chefs, I would say, hey, I'm Andrew, I'm here to help you with food waste. And what do you think I saw? What did I get back? I got a lot of kind of arms crossed, 
Like, who are you? What do you want? And, and, and then I would get a little bit of skepticism followed by often a response like, we don't have much food waste. And at the onset, I would accept that and say, okay, great, you're, you're someone who doesn't have a problem, let's move on and, and go, uh, go look elsewhere to, to solve this problem. But I came to learn over time that I wasn't getting the whole story. And through uh, education from some of our client partners who took me aside and educated me, I learned food waste was a bit of a hot topic. It, it was an unsafe topic. It was one that people didn't want to acknowledge. There were many folks who had been trained that if you have food waste, you're doing a bad job. And so here was I showing up with a machine to measure your transgressions, right? You can imagine why that might not have been an entirely welcome concept in, in, in 2005. The other thing, though, that I learned was that there, was, there, there were a number of people who just simply didn't see the problem. And, you know, we've joked over the years that food waste is the elephant in the room. It is something that is so big and yet so uh, expected that we just don't see it anymore. We are numb to it. That elephant stands there right next to us as we're working. And so some of the people who told me they didn't have food waste, it wasn't about them feeling threatened. It was literally they didn't think they had it. And you would come along and look in the garbage and say, well, what about this? And they go, oh, that's interesting. And so getting people to start to pay attention to something was a big part of this journey because we knew that uh, we had to, people had to acknowledge that there was a problem if we were going to be able to, to begin fixing it. So this was me going out and doing training. I decided that I would go uh, learn everything I could by spending as much time with chefs as I could because I had a technology background and I knew I didn't know nearly enough. I, I also managed to lose a fair amount of weight over the years, but I spent a lot of time uh, in kitchens and people, people taught me some things and some really critical things while we were out training. The first thing that I learned was that frontline food service teams really don't like food waste. And there is, when you talk to someone who's working at the very front line, there is a visceral understanding of this. And I will never forget being in a hospital in New York, I won't say where exactly, and I walked into the pot room, pot wash area, and the pot washer came up to me. And he said, who are you and what are you doing here? I think those were literally the words. And it was one of those moments where I realized I wasn't being welcomed. And, you know, pot washers aren't maybe known always for being super excited to welcome visitors. And so I said, I'm Andrew, and I'm here to help you reduce food waste. And he looked at me, and he said, well, it's about time. And he proceeded to walk me through his perceptions. And he said, I look at all the food that we throw away here through his hands every day. And I think about all the good that could be done in the world uh, with that food. And he talked about his days off he, where he would spend some time at his church and he'd think about the good that could be done there for people in need. And this was, was a huge wake up for me that, that, that this was something that was deeply felt by many who were watching it. The folks who literally were, were cleaning pans and trimming things and, and could see it, see it happening. And these folks were going to be the global change makers on this issue, the people who were going to solve it. The other thing that was going on around this time was people were talking about sustainability. It was on the agenda at every conference, and I know it still is, but at that time, the way we talked about it was in a big, broad way. We talk about sustainability is about uh, waste and water and energy and engaging people and food sourcing. And this was actually a slide I resurrected from a presentation I gave in 2009. And so the problem was that if you try to do everything, you can't do anything very well. And so people were trying to do just a little bit of each of these things and trying to up-level things. And what's been fascinating is that as we've gone along, we've learned that when you work on food waste, you tend to work on everything because food waste is a nexus issue. Food waste is something that, uh, and I'll come to this in a moment, touches on many parts of the sustainability equation. However, I, I want to spend a moment and just mention that in the course of going out and teaching on sustainability and trying to get people interested in food waste, I found that I had to build a scaffolding of understanding every time. And it usually began with explaining to people why food waste mattered, then why prevention of food waste mattered the most, then why measurement was the route to prevention, and finally why someone should take the time and spend the money to automate prevention. And I told this story over and over and over again. 
And one of the interesting things about teaching is actually that you learn. And what I learned was on that foundational level about why food waste matters, I learned about how much of a nexus issue it was. And it became just like peeling the, the, the uh, you know, the layers of an onion as I, as I went through this and I learned about the impact on climate and the impact on land use and soil health and water, resource conservation, petroleum-based inputs into our agricultural system, hunger. And it really became clear that if we were working on food waste, we were going to work on everything. We were going to help with, with, with food, we were gonna, you know, food issues, we were going to help with water issues, we were going to help with energy and climate issues. So, even though at that point not many people were super psyched about what we were up to, we said, this is too important, we got to really dig in and do this. And so um, we, we decided to stay, stay the course, and, and, and indeed now it's been 15 years. So the, the second thing, though, that we discovered was that there was a significant financial savings here, and we knew this up front because we'd been targeting that, but we came to understand all of it. Initially, we were thinking food waste was just about food cost, but over time we came to realize, wow, no, it's the cost of disposal, it's the cost of labor that's put into the food that we produce and discard, it's the cost of the energy as we refrigerate product and cook it and clean the vessels, and the lost profits. And this all adds up, and it became clear that we were paying five times for something that was giving us zero value. And so there was a clear economic case for spending time on this. And so folks started to, to, to give it a shot and pay attention to it. And we started certainly to see on the very cutting edge of this, the college and university dining community coming together around this. And I think this community should be very proud of the fact that it helped to bring this focus globally to this topic. So we learned also along the way that a lot of the waste that was occurring was occurring because people were trying to manage risk. And it was the risk of running out, so they made too much, or the risk of food safety, so we'd throw away food that was perfectly good. The ethic of, if in doubt, throw it out, uh, which now I ask, you know, if in doubt, why not try to address the doubt? And, um, you know, worrying about merchandising and making it beautiful, so merchandising so much food that we might not actually ever use it and knew we wouldn't. So all of these things contributed to the problem and helped us understand it. Which brings us to where we are now. So we've been on this journey um, as an industry, and I'm happy to say that there are some things that are going really well right now. But I will also tell you, we're getting some things wrong. There are some things that are not where they need to be, and there's work to be done. So let's start with the things that are going well. So first of all, we have a UN Sustainable Development Goal to cut food waste by 50% by 2030. Who could have imagined that the United Nations would set a global goal to cut food waste in half um, in 2015, which they did. So that's helped coalesce a lot of focus of entrepreneurs bringing capital to the table. You've got things like Toast Ale, which is creating beer from leftover bread. You've got uh, Refed, which is a, an organization working on food waste nonprofit that has built an in, entire investment case that says if the U.S. were to spend $18 billion, we could get $100 billion in savings back and cut U.S. food waste by 20%. That's their roadmap. And so what you're seeing is a massive number of innovators, operators, uh, governments coming together to work on this issue. And that's exciting and wonderful. At the same time, we're still wasting. The social norms have not changed. Uh, when we uh, put on an event, we're often more worried about running out than we are worried about food waste. We tend to be very focused on pre-consumer food waste, back of the house, things we control, and less so on what's going on with guests and students. These are things that are going to need our attention as we move forward. I think that it's also important to remember that there is a food waste hierarchy, and I will apologize, this is the one slide that is in every food waste presentation. I promise this wouldn't be a normal one, but I have to go to the hierarchy because this is the EPA's structure for how you're supposed to deal with food waste, right? Start with prevention, then move to feeding hungry people, feeding animals, industrial uses like energy production, then composting, then landfill. But the, the irony is that we've worked this from the bottom up, and we're still doing it. Um, the things that are tangible, that we can touch, we tend to embrace first. So compost is really exciting for that reason. Uh, food donation is really exciting for that reason. But the food waste prevention piece, will get some attention, is the most overlooked part of the equation. And so I'm a big fan of composting, and I'm, I'm, not, I'm not in any way against it. But I want to point out that when we create 
a place to put food waste, we in some ways excuse it. And I'll share a little bit of data on what this looks like in a moment. Similarly, when we give away food, we donate our excess edible food, which by the way, we absolutely should be doing, but we have to do it in a way that doesn't create structures that depend upon it and that expect it to the point where we're overproducing to donate, where our teams are becoming philanthropists with our food dollars. And unfortunately, some of that does happen. So we have to find a balance where we're doing the things which are good and important, um, but we're not skipping the thing which is most important, which is dealing with prevention which is dealing with waste at the source, not having it, turning off the leak. And I explain this a little bit like the analogy of coming into a kitchen and finding water gushing out of the wall, right? What's the first thing you do? Do you go get a, a, a mop and a bucket? Or do you actually turn off the water and then deal with the cleanup? And that's, that's still where we need to be with food waste. We need to be turning it off or at least minimizing it. So this is some data I wanted to share with you. It's a terrific study from Ohio State from a researcher named Brian Rowe. And he did, uh, he did some research about how people think about composting. And so he brought three cohorts, and I'll paraphrase this and probably get a little bit wrong, but he brought three cohorts to lunch. Each cohort was allowed to eat as much as they wanted. The first group got a lecture on something unrelated to food waste. That's the uneducated group, and this just illustrates how much they wasted per person from that lunch. Then they had the second group, which got a lecture on food waste, and they looked at how much they had wasted. And then the third group got a lecture on food waste, and they were told that everything that they didn't eat would be composted. Check that out. So what happened was people heard the message, they cut their, their, their waste down, and then when they heard it would be composted, they said, it's okay, because this is called a finite pool of worry. We can't worry about everything in the world. So as soon as someone gives us an answer where we go, okay, I recycled it, I won't worry about that plastic beverage, or I composted it, so I won't worry about food waste, we've got to be really careful, guys, at this point, because this is, you know, if we're going to change this, we can't settle for the, the minimum intervention, the most mediocre intervention. We have to move up and deal with prevention. The other thing that's happening that I'm worried about is the talk about zero waste, and Trust me, I would be the first to step up and applaud true zero waste. But so often now we talk about zero waste and we say, well, it means 90% of our waste is diverted from landfill, 10% is retained. Well, for me, that's kind of like I'm in Alice in Wonderland. Like, since when does 10% waste equal zero? And if we actually are just diverting it from landfill and we still made as much waste, is that an accomplishment? Shouldn't we be talking about not just diversion from landfill, but how we can minimize these things? And so I think these are some things that we have to be really attentive to, because there are easy stories to tell. And they're great stories. They warm our heart. We talk about donating food. We talk about composting. We talk about zero waste. They're great, except they're not great if that's where we stop. And we don't deal with prevention, which is really the heart of the problem. So with that, I'm going to turn to the future, and where I think our focus needs to be. Uh, again, we have a lot of things going well, but we have some things that, we're, we're, that are not great and we're, just, we're short of the goal, goal, goal line on this. So in the future, we need to focus on prevention. We need to acknowledge that it's the only option that impacts our bottom line and it's the only one that delivers the real significant environmental and social benefits. And that's because only when we don't use the food do we take the load off the food system. Because most of the environmental consequence of the food that we throw away happens way back when we produced it. Not from the landfill where it's emitting methane, although that is also a problem. The real heart of this is way upstream. And the only way we solve the upstream, upstream problem is by not bringing that product in and not wasting it. Everything else is an accommodation and a compromise. So we've got to focus there. And what does food waste prevention look like? I mean, it looks like you have a baseline where you're starting and you have less, and that dotted box is what you've prevented. Now, herein lies the challenge, right? Because unless you have a little dotted line around that, you can't see it. So we've got to make the invisible visible. And this is the challenge that's in front of us, and it's one of the reasons we believe so strongly in the importance of measurement, because the only way that food waste prevention ends up on the scoreboard, along with these other things, is when we actually can show data to show that things are improving. Next up, I want to point out that in our future vision, we're going to need to focus on overproduction a lot. We find that this is the primary driver of food waste. We see that over 50% of the information that we track at LeanPath uh, is overproduction. 
And this has a lot to do with risk management, as I mentioned earlier, where people are trying to match supply and demand and concerned about getting it wrong. And so we make a lot. I'm not suggesting we should run out, but I am suggesting we need to pay attention to how much we're overproducing. And we need to look at ways to draw it in and tighten those margins up significantly. And one of my pet peeves and concerns, I guess, is that so much of our conversation at the chef level is about creative um, nose to tail, root to stem, using maybe an odd bit here or an odd bit there to do something that is really creative. And by all means, let's do that. But as chefs, my challenge to this community is to step up and get us focused on overproduction. Because truly, that's the big stuff. That's the stuff that's going to make the biggest impact in the world. And we don't want, we, we can do all the other creative things, but we've got to go after the thing that's really voluminous and problematic. We also are going to have to engage both our teams and our guests if we're going to change social norms. Because if we change a social norm, we change behavior. When we change behavior, we can reduce waste. So on the kitchen side, we've got to help our frontline food service teams understand that they are the global change makers. And this is a picture of a garbage train. Uh, it's about a mile long. It leaves Seattle, Washington several times a week, and it comes down to the state of Oregon, where I live, and they dump it in a landfill. And it's pretty amazing to look at that garbage train uh, as it uh, transits down the Columbia River Gorge, which is a uh, national scenic area. If you haven't been there, I encourage you to visit. And when I talk to frontline teams, I explain to them, I show them this, and I say, who has the ability to pull a full car off of that train? And they think about it, and I say, you know, it's not you and me at home, but it is us at work. Because when we look at the volume of food that we touch in colleges and universities, as well as other high volume food service operations, we have control. We are the ones who can actually make a huge dent in this part of the problem, the food service and hospitality part of the food waste problem. We can't wait for somebody else. This is ours. We need to do it. And so explaining to our frontline teams the critical role that they play, and it's emotional. People get it. Like, when you talk to them about it, they feel it. And, and also, when you have the chance to, to really understand that what you're doing is critically important, feeding people is critically important, but this is also going to be about saving the planet, and you're part of that. So we have to do that. One of the ways we do that is by getting people engaged in measurement. And it's one of the things that was one of my biggest learnings and probably something people don't think about when they think about lean path or measurement, which is that, yes, you get data and all these other things and you learn and change, but you engage people. Everyone in the kitchen, not just the chef, not just a production manager, every single person who touches food is also responsible for tracking it if it becomes waste. And that's amazing because people start to think about this and they start to get excited about it. And the amount of feedback that we get from people, creative ideas, things that we can do better. Um, you know, I'll be standing in a kitchen and someone will tug at my sleeve and I'll say, hey, and they'll tell me about, you know, something that's going wrong, like people are dating the sandwiches for three days, but they're getting the date off by 12 hours, so they're getting thrown out a day early and things like that. You're like, great, let's go fix that. And so we have purpose and meaning and impact and it's a really uh, wonderful thing. We also, though, have to have the courage to bring this issue to our consumers, our guests, our students. This is not something that just happens in our hands. We have to change behavior and social norms with our guests. And this is scary because for years we've understood that portions equate to value as opposed to, I think we know now, flavor, nutrition equates to value. And so this is an opportunity at this moment when people have an open mind on food waste and sustainability to begin shifting these things. And one of the things that we found fascinating, we've started putting up digital signage boards in operations where when we, we actually have scales underneath the dish return. So as people scrape their trays, we in real time, these signs change. And so as the next person goes through the line, it says we've thrown away 25 meals today. Now 26, now 27, now 28. And we're using behavioral science nudges to get people to think differently about what they're wasting. And this is particularly apt in the college and university setting where we have a lot of all-you-care-to-eat dining operations where people aren't going to govern their consumption by their dollars. They, it's not limited by what's in their wallet. They have a swipe. 
particular points, and they're using them, we have to raise consciousness and get them to be engaged in fighting this problem with us. And we found it works, things like loss aversion. People don't like to hear that meals are being lost. They don't like it when they find out that they are out of step with social norms. When you put up data like an injunctive norm that says, you know, 95% of people think wasting food is bad, and at the moment you're one scraping it in the garbage, maybe you think differently. And so this isn't about shaming anyone, but what it is about is raising awareness and fluency, commitment and passion to resolving this issue. So we talked about past and present and future, and I hope that the future includes this kind of engagement, both with our teams and with our customers. I also hope that this, this future includes engagement with a broader community of stakeholders. And I put here a wastewater treatment plant just because I'm going to bet that most culinarians, maybe most people in the room here, probably have not taken the field trip to your wastewater plant um, or, or perhaps to the local composting operation. Maybe you have. You do, however, probably know where some of the food comes from. You've been to farms, you've been to ranches, you know that. This, this is a system, and we have to be capable of talking about both sides of the equation. This means building coalitions with folks you may not have spoken to before, solid waste authorities, wastewater treatment facilities, governments, NGOs, people who are working on technical assistance around reducing waste. There's a ton of resources out there. They're not culinary. They happen to be waste-related. We've got to bring these two worlds together and get them talking to each other and understand that our responsibilities don't stop at the loading dock door. When we walk out there and we throw something in a compost bin or the garbage, we need to know where it goes. And over time, our customers are going to expect, us of that, expect that of us. We also need to think about circularity. And circularity is a concept that's coming um, into the forefront of people's thinking in Europe. It has been less present here in the US, but it's the idea that one person's um, waste is the feedstock for another process, another person's creation. And the idea is to not lose value. The idea is to try to not downcycle, but to actually create scenarios where we can take product and move it from one place to the next. So if we take that bread that's left over and it becomes toast ale, you know, that's exciting. We're creating a system there where something's valuable. If we are in a position to actually know what we're throwing away in our compost and its energy content based on how much fats or oils or grease are in it, we might actually be able to charge a biogas plant an appropriate price for taking that away because it's going to produce more energy than if it was just, say, trimmings and greens. So these sorts of things are going to become, in the future, things we have to think about. How do we interchange? Um, how do we sell our food waste for value? Um, and how do we make sure, first and foremost, that we prevent it and not have it? The other things that I'll mention that are exciting, disclosure. We need to be ready to tell our stories publicly, transparently. This is a report from Tesco, the big grocer based in the UK. They now publish a report on food waste um, publicly every year. And I know that many sustainability reports in colleges and universities touch on this topic. I would encourage us to all do this to all get out there and to transparently tell the story because it's not going to be pretty, but it is one of those things that is going to change social norms and get people to do things differently and think differently. And on that point, we're going to also need to be working at scale. And one of the things that has happened uh, that's pretty exciting for our world at LeanPath was about a month ago, uh, Sodexo, uh, the large contract management organization, um, made a decision that they were going to measure food waste globally in all of their operations effectively where it made sense and in 3,000 operations in the next year, um, working with our team at LeanPath. And that's me sitting there with the CEO, uh, Denny Machuel of Sodexo. For us, this is a huge thing for our business. It's exciting and it's terrific to be able to help Sodexo make a huge impact. But what I think is important about this is that this is an at-scale initiative. This is moving away from the realm of experiment, pilot, do this one or two places, and it's doing it broadly. And I hope that it changes expectations in our industry. I hope that we stop talking about just preventing food waste in our largest dining hall. And we talk instead about how we're going to catch all that catering waste that's slipping through our fingers and all the waste at the coffee shops and anything else that's happening. We've got to get our hands wrapped around this and get after it. At LeanPath, we're committed to doing that. This is our team. Uh, we had a little, little painting exercise where we uh, took a photo. Uh, our vision is to ensure a sustainable future by eliminating global food waste. And the way we do that is by trying to make food waste prevention and measurement everyday practice in the world's kitchens. And so we are dedicated to that. 
We do that by creating food waste prevention platforms, which I think is important to understand. This goes beyond just measuring. You've got to actually create tools for people to prevent. And that's where the exciting future for us is, is in inventing ever smarter, more sophisticated AI-driven solutions to help people prevent food waste. And we're excited to say that over time, we've reduced about 36 million pounds of waste since 2014. Uh, we're saving about one pound every two seconds. And in the college and university segment, about 14 million pounds our client partners have saved in the last few years. And so I applaud you as an industry um, for the progress that has occurred here. It's a, a massive impact. Um, colleges, like I said, and universities are leading the way. And so I'll close by saying, please don't look at food waste as garbage. Please look at it as a bag of ideas. It's a critical control point. Everything in that bin is an opportunity to do better and improve. And so look at it with fresh eyes when you leave here, I hope. Uh, I hope that's what you'll do. Uh, and uh, remember, we need to get this elephant out of the room. So thank you very much. I appreciate your time today. Thank you.